Well, good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the webinar. I want a couple quick housekeeping items before we get into the presentation. We've got everybody muted, just a large number of participants on the webinar, so it cuts down on some of the background noise. Kind of two ways to ask questions. Uh, we use Twitter, so if you're a Twitter user or if not, you know, might explore it between now and maybe another webinar that um, we uh, present. We use hashtag SHS webinars. That way you can post questions. We have a team member that answers them in real time, plus it provides uh, a place where you can go back and review, you know, questions that uh, other people uh, may have posed even on other webinars. So. Um, that um, you also have a dialog box in the go to meeting window pane that you can post a question um, if you're not quite ready to go uh, to the Twitter route yet um, and in that dialog box I'll kind of go through those when we wrap up and answer any questions that are placed there throughout the uh, presentation the uh, last thing I wanted to mention because I know we have some uh, non-public Indiana schools on the webinar is we um, noticed that in the budget that just came out of the Indiana General Assembly that it looks like they added $500,000 in Homeland Security grant money related to security. And this is something that's been available to public schools uh, the last couple years. And so as we get into uh, one of the solutions we developed a uh, visitor management system called Safe Visitor. We've had a large number of public schools use that funding um, to start or implement Safe Visitor. Um, so just wanted to put that out there too on your radar screen that there may be some money is available for you to help with some of these security uh, items, especially for non-public schools here in Indiana. Um, what do I want to talk about today? You know, lessons from the San Bernardino school shooting. Uh, you know, I'm Mike McCarty. I'm the CEO and founder of Safe Hiring Solutions. I'm also CEO of RefLink, which is an automated reference checking platform, Safe Visitor, which we'll talk a little about, and then Safe Recruiter, which is a uh, talent acquisition or recruiting uh, software that we have called Talent Link that's part of Safe Recruiter. Also the president of the Indiana Association of Background Screeners. So Indiana is actually the only state that has a statewide coalition of background screening firms that actively engage with the le legislative process. And so through that, <clears throat> you know, we, we tried to uh, made relationships over the last several years and really try to help policymakers make some wise decisions uh, as it relates to background screening. Those of you from Indiana, again, uh, I, I mentioned a lot of things with Indiana, and I know we've got clients uh, or uh, participants all over the country, uh, but we just ended a legislative session here, and there was a bill, 1079, that passed out of the Indiana legislature related to background screening in schools, and we've got a series of webinars on that as well. So that's applicable for you. Uh, you can find that, and I'll put a slide up here as we wrap up where you can get that information. Prior to starting Safe Hiring, I was a violent crime detective in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, began doing a lot of consulting work for Department of Justice, Defense, Homeland Security, which really led to starting Safe Hiring Solutions 13 years ago. So what, what is the San Bernardino incident? Um, well, this is a, a case that happened about three weeks ago now, I believe it was. Um, we had actually just had a meeting of our Safe Visitor Advisory Board that morning, got back to the office and saw the news break. So the case study here is a teacher with the San Bernardino schools, uh, separated, going through a divorce with her husband, history of domestic violence, that he had convictions for domestic violence, drugs and weapons. And so during that separation, um, they, uh, he comes to the school and tells the front office staff that he needs to drop something off. So uh, s assumption here is no policy about whether or not that's allowed or not. Uh, he was granted access. He walked down the hall, walked into her classroom with a 357 Magnum pistol, shot and killed her, shot and killed another student standing right next to her, and shot a third student uh, who survived. And so 
you know, it's not one of those cases where, you know, it's fun to talk about these things, but the, the reality is, as a former violent crime detective, we spent an inordinate amount of time in law enforcement conducting fatality reviews. Many states have statutory requirements now on child abuse, especially child homicides or domestic homicides, where they have fatality review teams, and even statutorily it may define who participates in those. And the idea behind this is you're not pointing blame uh, when something like this happens. What you want to do is take an incident like this, kind of divide it up, dissect it, and look at are there any things that we could learn from this to prevent this from happening in the future. And that's really what we want to do here. This is what we did when I joined the Nashville Metropolitan Police Department back in 1991. I was a patrol officer for about three years and one of the things I learned very quickly is I spent an enormous amount of time on an evening or midnight shift responding to family crisis. Uh, we were at a kind of a, a, a real pendulum shift here in the United States up until about the early 90s, most parts of the United States, we had not really what I call criminalized domestic violence. And, and what I mean by that <clears throat> is everything was treated as an assault and battery. And most misdemeanors in the United States, a, pr a police officer cannot prosecute for a misdemeanor they did not witness. Now, states can give exceptions to that, and so some of the first exceptions were DUI. Um, and so in the early 90s, we started to see exceptions granted for domestic violence. And so those exceptions started to say, if I show up as a police officer and I develop probable cause, I can make an arrest even if the victim doesn't want to prosecute because the idea is they're too scared to prosecute. And so we had done really fatality reviews and we looked at the numbers in Nashville and we noticed that you know year in and year out, as far as we kept statistics going back um, you know into the 80s and beyond, we averaged about 25 women and children killed by domestic violence every year in the city of Nashville. That is a large number of people that are losing their life to somebody who claimed to have loved them at some point. So what we did in 1994 is we developed, uh, I helped develop and implement what became the largest police-based domestic violence program in the United States. It was a community-based program. It was very unique for law enforcement because law enforcement typically didn't do a lot of work with other community community agencies, healthcare, social service, uh, advocacy programs. And one of the things that uh, came out of this program is by earlier intervention, um, and raising public awareness and coordinating responses with other organizations as we dropped the domestic homicide rate in Nashville by over 50% the first year. So if you look at that, I mean, that's kind of, you know, we're talking statistics here, but let's put that in real terms. 25 women and children in one year, we saved 12 or 13 lives just by implementing this program and just kind of taking a different approach to how we were going to respond to family violence. The other outcome is the number of women reporting domestic violence increased by over 50%. So the more people that are telling us, the more opportunity we have to intervene, the less likely that somebody is going to die. And so these same lessons can be applied, you know, to like the incident in San Bernardino. Um, you know, uh, how do we get victims in our organizations from a human resource perspective comfortable and confident in our organization that they're going to walk in and tell us that they're going through a divorce, there is a history of violence or a protective order has been issued or there's threats that have been made. And so the first step here is really as an organization understanding domestic violence and then creating policies and procedures where your uh, employees feel comfortable and confident in the process that if they speak out, first and foremost, that they're going to find some help. And secondly, that speaking out is really uh, a huge aid to the organization because now you can place things in process that can help protect them and uh, help protect uh, the other employees that are working around them. So what is domestic violence? It's all about power and control. Um, this is not a crime of passion. I don't care how many times you hear that in the media, how many times a movie comes out of Hollywood. 
that you know uh, even some of the the media coverage of the San Bernardino case is, you know could make you think that this guy snapped he freaked out he lost it walked into the school no it's not the case I mean if this guy had really lost it he doesn't walk in and you know sign in and try to go down to the classroom he would have walked in with you know guns blazing so I would say just the opposite in you know the years of, of working these cases I would say that domestic abusers are very calculated and manipulative. Calculated in that over and over during fatality reviews or studying other cases where uh, you know adults or children were killed uh, in domestic violence that we see how much thought and effort goes into the homicide. The other kind of key statistic here, a key takeaway, is understanding that 75% of people that are killed in a domestic violence situation are killed after they leave the perpetrator. You know, we've got this horrible kind of uh, myth here in the United States that um, if a victim would just leave uh, a violent situation that the problem will be solved. The reality is leaving doesn't always solve it. Oftentimes leaving can be an escalator if we don't have things in place to help protect that victim. So the San Bernardino case is a great example of leaving and how that can turn into a very violent incident. And so in that scenario, if he's uh, 100% focused on killing the victim, where's the one place he's going to find that victim? In the workplace. I helped uh, develop and was part of a seven-member anti-stalking team that was part of this domestic violence unit. And, you know, one of the things that we realized very quickly was how frequently domestic violence was coming into the workplace, particularly with stalking and after separation violence. You know, if I move into a shelter or, you know, uh, move in with somebody where the perpetrator doesn't know where I'm at, the one thing that they are fairly certain of is I'm going to show up to work tomorrow. I'm coming to school, I'm coming to the bank, wherever it is that I work. So really, that's all the, you know, perpetrator has to do is hang out somewhere around that facility to be able to locate that victim. You know, from a lethality assessment standpoint, and these are kind of indicators that we train law enforcement, when you start to see these behaviors, then it shows an increased likelihood of potential future lethal assault. And so what I highlighted in red here was just based on the media. I have not talked to anybody in law enforcement. I, I've not seen anything beyond media reports. So if I take what I see in the media and I've looked at multiple accounts and those things that are consistent, if I can believe what I'm reading, these are the things that uh, were evident in the San Bernardino case. And when we start to see one, two, or three of these, we start to really have our flags go up. And you can see in this particular case, we're talking about a minimum of six different uh, behaviors that this perpetrator um, actually displayed. And some of these we may not even ever know, you know, like clinically dep depressed or, you know, threats that were being made in private. And so these are kind of some of the things, threats of homicide or suicide, fantasies of homicide or suicide. He obviously had access to weapons. He had a 357 Magnum. He had been convicted of, convicted of weapons charges in the past. He had also been convicted of domestic violence, which makes it interesting because that is an enabler under federal law. If you are convicted of an enabling domestic violence crime, misdemeanor or felony, you are precluded from owning uh, certain uh, firearms. You can still own long guns that fit into certain categories, but you cannot uh, uh, own handguns of which he had access to somehow, some way. Ownership of the victim, that is basically, you know, the, their property. We would see this in law enforcement a lot of times in what I would call tags, um, how they refer to the victim, my old lady, or um, this is my, 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 my. When you start hearing all that very... Uh, ownership type language, it really starts to give you a glimpse into, you know, what that relationship looks like. Obsessed with the victim or family. We've talked about separation. We saw that in San Bernardino, that 75% greater risk, clinical depression. Where do they have access? Well, 
I don't know where this teacher in San Bernardino was staying after she left her uh, husband and was filing for divorce, but the one place they still had access was at the school. Hostage taking, the FBI will tell you that about 78% of the hostage situations in the United States are as a result of family violence. Escalation of batter risk, what this is, this is really where domestic violence becomes public. The majority of domestic violence is behind closed doors. Uh, it's well hidden. People don't see it. Once it starts to come out in the public arena, showing up at work or things are happening in front of other people, that's a huge escalation in risk that these abusers are taking. What's the previous contact with police? This is a real interesting concept because the FBI statistics will tell you that the best indicator for future violence is a past history of violence. But yet in the United States, we've had this major pendulum shift um, where really we're seeing major restrictions on what can be reported in background screening, a uh, big push to try to lower the number of incarcerated people. And, and I'm not saying that some of these pushes are not valid uh, pushes, but at the same time, Time, we can't group everybody into one category because we certainly know that with violent offenders the best indicator for future violence is that past history of violence. Drugs or alcohol, um, you know, we know that was uh, potentially part of this. I will also say that the drugs and alcohol do not cause the violence. They may lower inhibitions. The, you know, drugs and alcohol, he had been convicted of this, the perpetrator in San Bernardino, doesn't necessarily mean he was on any kind of substance the, the day he walked into that school. If, in fact, he was, it could have been, uh, you know, used to kind of lower inhibitions, uh, numb a little bit to actually follow through with this. And then there's some other signals. Uh, marital rape, much more common than, than uh, a lot of people would realize. Actually, a study came out this week I saw where I think there were 6,000 reported sexual assaults within the military, so it was up significantly. But understanding uh, rape and sexual assault like domestic violence, what the military's been doing for years is raising awareness, so now more people are reporting it. So it's not that there's this epidemic necessarily in the military. It's that they are starting to get more and more victims feeling comfortable in reporting it. And so they've got more documented cases, which then provides them more opportunities to provide help um, and also prosecute those that are responsible. Violations of protective orders. This is one you'll deal with potentially a lot as an employer where you have employees that seek a protective order to keep them safe during estrangement, a divorce, or after leaving a violent uh, partner. And these are important things to know as an employer so that you can provide um, opportunities for helping to protect not only the victim that may be an employee, but anybody that works or is around them. Um, you know, one of the things we've done uh, with Safe Visitor is created a, a, an advisory board. We've got a pretty deep, broad base of security experts that really work with us and help us define how we um, continue to build out Safe Visitor. We've got uh, Paul Dvorak, who's uh, with the U.S. Secret Service. He runs the local Indianapolis office here. He's been on a presidential detail um, providing security for presidents. Dottie Davis is director of security at Fort Wayne Community Schools. It's one of the largest school districts in the country. She's a former police chief. She's also a domestic violence expert, so I've known Dottie for probably 20-plus years. Tony Vespa. Uh, He's uh, president of Vespa Group. He's a former Navy SEAL and cyber intelligence expert. Mike Greenwald, system engineer, central security and communication, so brings a breadth of knowledge in uh, how to deploy technology uh, and uh, in the process of helping to protect organizations. And Pete Just, who's the chief information officer for Wayne Township Schools here in Indianapolis. The morning of the San Bernardino incident, Paul Dvorak, we were uh, wrapping up our meeting before this incident had happened, and one of the things he was talking about to the group is the first step in protection is a secured perimeter. Um, actually just had an article come out in Indiana inside Indiana Business this morning really talking about this topic. If, so if you're on Twitter, uh, you know, you can follow me at, at Mike McCarty SHS, and I just posted a link to this article, but this was really driven by this conversation that Paul had about how do you keep people safe, and so as a former 
uh, you know, member of a security detail tasked with pr protecting the President of the United States, he said that perimeter has got to be wide. And he said if that perimeter is too close, then once it's penetrated, there's no way to protect a person or an organization. And so we have to think in, t in the same type of terms within, you know, uh, a school district or our employment, our building, how do we create that perimeter that is wide enough that we keep this out of and things that we can do to try to keep this out of our building before it ever gets into the building. That's the best method we have of protecting ourselves. The first thing that uh, we really need to look at is you got to have a, a really you need a quality visitor management uh, <clears throat> Uh, controls um, to access to visitors. You know, how are you controlling the flow of people in and out of your organization? The ability to create exclusion lists. So if this teacher in San Bernardino comes in and discloses that she's a strange, she a protective order, there's a history of violence, they can place now this estranged uh, husband on a, an excluded parties list so he's flagged as he tries to enter a building before he ever gets into the building or before he gets past the front desk. Um, emergency notifications built into the system. Uh, Safe Visitor that we build is the only visitor management system in the U.S. that has fully integrated background checks. And so, you know, for different classifications of visitors, how are you vetting them? At what depth are you vetting them before you're allowing them access to your facility? So I'm going to show you really quickly, this is a high-end overview of how a safe visitor, how a visitor management system can work. I will also tell you, if you really want to dig into this a little bit deeper, we're happy to set up a, a more detailed demonstration. So we're just going to kind of hit some highlights here. But this is safe visitor. It's a cloud-based uh, visitor management system. This is what the dashboard looks like. So if I'm working in the front office, what I can see is anybody that's checked into my building. If I'm an administrator, I see all my buildings. Um, Dottie, who I mentioned on our advisory board, I think they have 52 buildings in their school district. So she can see across 52. She can come in here. She can actually scan down to specific buildings and look at specific buildings. If I'm responsible for one building, I'm an attendant in one building. I'm only going to see who's coming in and out of my building. Um, how the process works, uh, somebody walks in, they're a temporary visitor. So in this case, uh, the, the, the gentleman in uh, San Bernardino that comes in, if they're running a system, the first step would be they're going to click on this. They're going to scan the 2D barcode on the back of their government-issued ID. Once they scan that, um, I don't know why these pop-ups are going crazy. Um, apologize for that. Um, once they scan that 2D barcode, it's going to run a background check. Um, on this particular type of visitor, it's going to run a national sex offender and excluded parties. So if we had them on the excluded parties list, it's going to flag them right there. You've got communications. You can hit a deny button. You can hit an emergency button. These are going to send text and emails to whoever you have configured. Uh, we have some schools across the country that actually use the emergency button and tie it into 911, so it actually sends an E911 request. Also sends, if you've captured a photo, because you got a reverse webcam assigned to this software that could capture their photo real quickly. Um, if everything's fine, you're going to you know, click a button, it's going to print a temporary ID badge, it has a red stop sign on it, put a sticker over the stop sign, six hours later the sticker uh, bleeds through the stop sign, comes back through so you know that that badge is expired if they come back tomorrow and try to re-enter the building. If you have other types of visitors that you want to manage, uh, or actually let me first say, you can also have everybody pre-register. So you know, you could have a policy that anybody showing up for uh, a meeting or any kind of event actually has to pre-register. And so they use this link right here that's configured specifically for your organization. They click on a link. They basically walk through and pre-register, enter all their information. Once they do that, 
ask, then uh, it's going to show up right here on the Visitors Arriving Soon tab. So if I'm working in the front office, every morning when I come to work, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this tab. I'm going to look, okay, who's coming in today? What I'm looking for is this green check mark right here. Because if I see a red X, I'm going to click on this to determine if the visitor that's pre-registered actually is on the exclusion list or they have failed the sex offender registry. Um, and so now if I have a red X and we deem that they are not allowed to visit our property, we're actually having contact with them on the telephone as opposed to them standing right here in front of our desk. So this is another way of pushing that perimeter out a little bit. You can actually pre-register for a seven day period so they can actually see anybody that's coming in over the next seven days. If you have, uh, as a school or a volunteer organization, if you have specific days where maybe you have like a grandparents day or a parents day um, where they're coming in, dads for donuts, um, you know, some of these events where um, maybe you're collecting this information from the classroom and you're putting it on a spreadsheet, you can actually upload a spreadsheet right here with a date on it and they're all preloaded. So when they walk in, all you're doing is hitting this up arrow and it's checking them in and giving them a badge, um, which is also then creating a log of anybody that's entered or exited your facility that's searchable um, going back as far as you need to go back. The other piece is it also can manage all of your volunteers, vendors, and we just added the ability that you could even manage all of your employees. We've got some schools here in Indiana that this new legislation passed this year that's effective this July that will be required to do ongoing background checks of all school employees every five years. We're able to create a registration type and upload them into the system and the system then handles all the notifications, all the notifications for rechecks, so it's actually automating the whole process. You have the ability to create as many registration types as you want. So if you're an organization like a school that might have even classifications of volunteers, we have some large schools that will have level one volunteer that has a background check of this, level two volunteer, this is the requirement for this one. So each registration type can also have the their own requirement for a background check and level of background check. You could have contractors, vendors, student teachers, uh, substitute teachers, employees, you know, any number of uh, registration types that you want to create and then they would basically click on this public access link and say, okay, I'm a teacher cadet. I click on next step. You have an agreement that they would agree to electronically. Each registration type can have its own agreement. So if you want uh, one registration type to uh, agree to some specific terms, you can add that. You've got the ability to add three or four links here. So in this example, one school district uh, here in Indiana, we've added their bullying video or their anti-bullying video. And so they click on this button, it opens it up, they view the anti-bullying video, they have to check that they viewed it, and then they move on and enter all their information. Once they've entered all of their data in for the background check, then it's going to submit that information one of two ways. If it's integrated like a volunteer background check with safe hiring or an employment background check, it's going to push it automatically to safe hiring, run the background check over the next two or three days. Then it's going to come back to safe visitor. When it comes back into safe visitor, if there's no criminal history, it's going to automatically approve them. It's going to send them a, um, an email with an electronic uh, ID badge that they can download. It will not have a photo, so the first time they visit your school, they're going to scan in with that ID. They're also going to present uh, a government-issued ID to you so you can confirm them. And then you're going to click a button, take their picture, and the system's going to automatically email them probably in the next 30 seconds a new electronic ID with their um, photo on it. It can be stored in a mobile app. We have geofencing built into the mobile app, which means we can take each one of your schools, set a geofence around it. So now if they're running the mobile app, as they approach your school, 
as soon as they cross that geo fence, they're going to pop up right here. So if they've been in, they've had their photo taken, it's going to look just like this. It's going to show everything about them. So when they come up and hit a buzzer, you can look at this. You can actually make this bigger if you need to, so you can see a larger picture. And then um, you can allow them into the building. So again, another way of creating that larger perimeter of uh, keeping folks out of the building that are not or should not be in the building or have no reason to be in the building. The last couple pieces I'll show you real quickly. Um, you have the visitor logs and so with the visitor logs um, this allows you to search through anybody that's ever visited your building. So in this example, I'm an administrator, so I can come in here and search across a specific building. I can search across a specific attendant that checks people in. I can do date ranges. I can search globally by a name to see if a certain person has ever uh, or how many times they've visited. Um, and then I can download all this information if I wanted to into an Excel or CSV file. Um, I can create my exclusion list, like I mentioned, where you add people to a list of folks that cannot come into your property. This can be on a global level across all your buildings or a single building that they're not allowed entry to. Um, we keep a denied entry log, so anybody that's ever been denied entry. And then we have a safe vendor component where the vendors um, are actually vetted by safe hiring. We have a set of criteria. And so a vendor that becomes safe vendor certified can now scan into any facility running safe visitor. So, you know, in the metropolitan Indianapolis area where we have a large number of school districts using this system, a vendor that actually provides services to multiple of, of these schools can actually do one background check and be able to scan in and out of each one of those facilities. So that is kind of a high-end overview, but an example of how you start to create this perimeter, how you take some of the lessons from San Bernardino and apply them to, to your organization um, where you're starting to create an environment where you say, you know, if I'm a school or I'm a church or I'm a volunteer organization and I work with sensitive populations or vulnerable populations, we need to control the flow uh, of, of people coming in and out of that facility and only those people that have a right to be in that facility um, are controlled and the access is controlled. We're even integrating with some access control systems so that uh, if you have multiple buildings, as your employees go from one building to the next, you would actually, uh, they could scan, you know, slide their ID at a building they're not assigned to, and they're going to show up on the dashboard. So they will be on the dashboard, and it'll create a log when they enter and exit that facility. All right, I'm going to pull the slides back up here and put some contact information up. Uh, you know, we've got uh, several more webinars over the next month. We try to keep them up there about 30 days out. If you go to Safe Hiring Solutions, click on Resources, and then there's a Webinar tab uh, lower on the page. It'll list any upcoming webinars and you can sign up for those. Uh, I would highly encourage signing up uh, for, for the tweets uh, and follow us on Twitter because uh, we put a lot of this information out via Twitter. I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to open up the dialog box and see if we have any questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Either I put you all to sleep or answered them. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you think of something after we get off the webinar um, or if you want more information. I'm going to put these slides up on SlideShare probably over the next day or so as well as we make a recording of the webinar. So if anybody else in your organization wants to you know, view the slides or you want to copy the slides and or, uh, you know, see the, you know, or, or share the uh, recorded webinar, we'll make those available as well. That's another good reason to follow us on Twitter because we put that out once we make those things available. Otherwise, have a great day and we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Goodbye.